Good afternoon and welcome to today's operational information update on the flooding and landslide situation in BC. For today's briefing, we'll have updates from Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Municipal Affairs Josie Osborne, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries Lana Popham. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll turn it over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations. Over the next week, we're expecting a series of storms to take place in our province, with the first of these storms happening now. We're redoubling our efforts to not only recover from the incredible destruction from last week's events, but to prepare and respond to the significant weather lining up through the next week. There are three big pulses of storms arriving with increasing intensity. The one we're seeing now, another over the weekend, and the biggest hitting around Tuesday. Environment Canada will continue to update the forecast, but the time to prepare is now. And for people to pay attention and be ready for the unpredictable weather that is coming to BC's coastal areas and the lower mainland. I'll, I urge all British Columbians to be extremely vigilant. Keep a close eye, 
on alert, weather alerts for your area from Environment Canada. Check regularly for updates, warnings and alerts from local governments and First Nation authorities. If you're able, stormproof your homes. At the very least, clear gutters and drainages. Make sure your emergency supplies include drinking water stored in an accessible place. And if you don't need to travel during stormy weather, please stay home. And if you are required to drive, please make sure your vehicle has food, water, warm clothes, blankets and other emergency supplies. If you're in a flood prone area, be prepared to ac evacuate if asked. I encourage everyone to take some time now to put together or refresh their emergency kits. Prepared BC has lots of great information to help you to get ready. I want to take a moment to again talk about the human side of this disaster. I want to offer my deepest condolences for the families who've lost loved ones. Thousands have been forced from their homes and properties and are all struggling with the stress, uncertainties and loss. And for those who are returning to flooded homes fighting through the heartbreaking task of dealing with the destruction left behind, we understand how difficult this can be. If you're evacuated or affected by flooding and need support, please contact your local designated reception centre or emergency support services. And as I mentioned yesterday, we've set up a Service BC contact centre line where people can speak with an agent and get information related to floods seven days a week. The toll free number is 1-833-376-2452. As we face these challenges together, be assured that the public service and thousands of workers, emergency workers, soldiers, first, responder, first responders, volunteers, transport drivers, railroaders and all levels of government and so many more are working on responding and recovering from this disaster and preparing for the expected storms ahead. Road maintenance contractors and crews with more than 250 pieces of heavy equipment are ready to go to where they're needed. More than 350 culverts have been inspected and the armed forces is supporting any necessary repairs. We have work crews and boots on the ground. Helicopters and airplanes flying missions all over the affected areas, helping, assessing and delivering food. We also have a contingent of emergency workers from Alberta who've come to help. And as you heard yesterday, we're working hard on a new BC flood strategy and will continue to invest in hundreds of flood mitigation projects. We are focused on supporting people and communities through this emergency and we will continue to support hundreds of First Nations and local governments in this response and in developing flood re risk reduction projects for the future. Lastly, I want to take a moment to recognize the role of the media in taking weather forecast data and making it real and immediate for people across the province. And to all British Columbians, Remember to be vigilant, prepared and calm and we'll all get through this. It will take a lot of work but we will get through this, we will come out of this stronger than ever and we will be a more resilient province. Thank you and I'll turn this update over to Minister Osborne. Thank you, Minister Farnworth, and good afternoon, everybody. I want to start also by acknowledging the territory of the Lekwungen people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and also to begin by acknowledging the incredible hardship that communities and people have paced, faced over the past week. I express my condolences to the families of the British Columbians who have lost loved ones, and I want to assure people in all communities impacted by floods and mudslides that we are here for you. We're working non-stop to open up transit corridors to keep supplies moving, providing financial support to individuals and families through the Red Cross, and setting up the, B the Service BC flood response line for people impacted by this disaster. Our government is working to support you. responders, Canadian forces, highway patrols and the many, many volunteers who have been working around the clock to keep people safe and protected. As the former Mayor of Vino, I understand the challenges that are faced when responding to emergencies. It's rare that we have to respond to disasters like this, both in the number and in the scale that we have seen lately. And we know that these shifts are due to 
global climate change. I want to acknowledge every local elected official and each one of their staff in these impacted communities. They are all working tirelessly alongside provincial agencies and they've shown simply heroic dedication to the people in their communities, working literally to fight the storm in an effort to save people, to save homes and to save livelihoods. Communities that just a few months ago were working with the province to battle wildfires are again rallying to support each other. And just the way that people come together to help one another, communities are coming together to help one another. Kelowna and Kamloops have both sent in crews to help Merritt get its water and sewage systems back up and running full speed and help with other urgent needs. And I am so moved and inspired by the generosity, the strength and the resiliency that is shown by communities and people during this time. Since the floods began, my staff and I have been in direct contact daily with local governments in impacted communities. Last week, my colleagues Minister Farnworth, Minister Fleming and Minister Popham joined me for regional calls with all the mayors, regional district chairs and city managers at local governments across BC to hear their concerns, to share information with them and to answer their questions. And this past week, my staff held additional calls to provide information and answer questions about the provincial state of emergency. And as I said, staff are in daily contact with the communities that are impacted, working in collaboration with other ministries to coordinate responses so that communities don't have to reach out to several ministries to get the answers that they need. We're hearing incredible gratitude for the work that people at Emergency Management BC are doing to support communities, and we're hearing specific concerns based on local expertise that we are acting on. We're also hearing a shared interest in building back better to make communities more resilient to climate change and these kinds of disasters in the future. What I've told local governments and will repeat here now is that nobody expects communities to do this alone. Supporting recovery, rebuilding infrastructure and maintaining community services will require coordination and engagement from all orders of government. My ministry and I are working alongside our government colleagues and with our federal partners to ensure that BC communities impacted by flooding and mudslides get the support they need. That includes the commitment of our government and the federal government to be there as partners with financial support for rebuilding community infrastructure as we recover. And as we have those larger conversations about rebuilding and recovery, emergency financial supports are in place for local government to meet immediate infrastructure needs. Local governments impacted by flooding are eligible for financial assistance through the Provincial Disaster Financial Assistance Program and that includes coverage for things like rebuilding or replacing essential public infrastructure, replacing essential materials and cleanup and debris removal. That funding is available now and communities are already applying. The Municipal Finance Authority of BC has also offered to help local governments to meet any immediate cash flow needs as they access disaster assistance funding and that will ensure that they can get the rebuilding work done as quickly as possible. So I encourage all communities to reach out uh, to the MFA should they need that assistance. And while these programs are supporting the many urgent community needs that we see, I want to be clear. I am committed to working with our federal partners to respond to the longer term financial need of communities as they work to rebuild the public infrastructure that the people in their communities depend on. As my colleagues here have said a number of times during the past week, these extreme weather events are likely to be more frequent in the future. Climate change means that we will need to continue adapting how we plan and prepare for natural disasters, ensuring that community infrastructure is built to withstand future events. Not just transportation routes, but local facilities like water and wastewater treatment plants. That's what we'll do. The events of the past year and a half have proven our ability to work together in addressing challenges like these, the pandemic, the heat dome, wildfires and now flooding. These are significant events individually, but together they've had catastrophic impacts on people and communities that would have been unimaginable even 10 years ago. The early days of the pandemic have shown us that when all orders of government work together to support people in communities, we can accomplish much, so much for the people that we serve. And this is another I will pass it over to Minister Fleming.
Thank you uh, very much, Minister Osborne, and uh, good afternoon. I would uh, like to begin the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure update today uh, with an update on Highway 1 in the Sumas area. We've had geotechnical engineers confirm that the road is safe for travel and it will open at 2 o'clock this afternoon. This will provide a lot of welcome congestion relief uh, and mobility for the region and I want to thank people for their patience over the past several days. However, I want to emphasize that while having the main artery open through the Fraser Valley is good news, it will not be travel as normal. Rather, it will be slow going with reduced speed limits and people will again ask to be patient. Uh, Highway 1 will not be subject to a travel order. It will be available for general travel, but we are asking people to consider whether their travel uh, is absolutely necessary. And a reminder that many of these temporary fixes are to get people in the region moving once again. And we'll be watching the road closely, uh, particularly in light of the rain that is falling now, uh, with more in the forecast. We hope and expect uh, that Highway 1 will be, will be able to remain open, but we will be constantly monitoring its performance and if necessary we may have to close the highway again because safety is always our first priority. But with that caution, this is definitely good news. Um, as we continue to reopen our highways, so, so we reopen our uh, supply, lane, supply uh, chains and reconnect our communities. Um, opening Highway 1 will help uh, relieve the congestion that we've seen on Highway 7. Travel restrictions will remain in place uh, on Highway 7 though uh, for the time being. We'll update uh, later on that. But Highway 7 has been deemed essential uh, for the movement of goods and services and will continue to be uh, for the near future. I want to move uh, to the Coquihalla and make some remarks uh, about some of the thinking around temporary repairs of a very significant provincial highway. Uh, we've all seen the images. The Coquihalla was heavily damaged by the deluge of these historical rains. Uh, all told, about 20 sites have been damaged, damaged or washed away, and that is about 130 kilometers uh, of the corridor uh, that is affected. Uh, this includes five bridges where spans completely collapsed or were otherwise heavily damaged. Uh, and this is going to be a daunting task to get that highway back to being fully operational, but I'm pleased to report that the work has begun right now. We have over 100 pieces of equipment working around the clock to restore temporary access as quickly as possible. We are currently blasting rock at three sites. We are mobilizing equipment to another two sites. Uh, we have completed the cleanup at two large debris flow uh, sites uh, on the Coquihalla as well. Um, as it relates to uh, site-specific updates uh, along the Coquihalla, moving from north from Hope uh, to Merritt, um, at the Jessica Bridge, we are currently installing a temporary bridge while we demolish the span that collapsed. At the Carolyn Bridge, construction access has been built. At the Bottle Top Bridge, we are working on installing a temporary access bridge to get crews across while we demolish the collapsed span there. At the Brody Bridge, we're working to protect uh, the abutments there. Um, at the Murray Flats, uh, we're currently rebuilding lanes at four different sites. And we're also conducting on the Coquihalla uh, in-river work. This is happening at many sites to prevent further erosion and to uh, properly channel the water back under the main spans. In terms of timelines, um, we're reasonably optimistic that enough temporary repairs can, com can be completed to allow commercial traffic uh, on the corridor in about two months' time by late January. But with that, I do have to caution that the weather will be a factor and a key consideration in determining whether we can uh, reach that target. When we do open up, uh, obviously like other highways that have been impacted, it won't be business as usual on the Coquihalla. There will be two segments, each 20 to 30 kilometers in length, where the highway will have to have reduced speeds and only one lane in each direction will be possible. Um, I suppose if there is something fortunate about the Coquihalla damage, it is that the areas that experienced the most challenging winter conditions were not as impacted and we will have the same road standard as before the storms. This includes uh, Snowshed Hill and across the Coquihalla Summit as well as Larson Hill and the segment from Larson Hill to Merritt. We'll be providing a lot more information about what drivers can expect along the corridor as we continue to work to uh, fix and remediate uh, Highway 5 uh, and as we uh, finalize some of the work plans that are being contemplated right now. Let me just say in closing that uh, we've never seen anything like this in BC in terms of uh, how many highways have been impacted all at once. We have 200 sites across the south coast and interior 
that were impacted. Uh, some of these highways are vital for the movement of essential goods, but all of them are vital for the people who live and travel in those areas. And I can't thank enough the crews who have been working flat out uh, in the rain, in the weather, uh, making immediate repairs to get people moving again. Uh, the stories of uh, what uh, those contractors have been able to accomplish working with Ministry of Transportation staff is nothing short of incredible. And I want to acknowledge the challenges of those uh, who are living in areas where restoring highway access is going to take many, many months simply because the damage has been so severe. And this includes Highway 1 through the Fraser Canyon. Uh, it includes Highway 8. We will move as quickly as possible to restore access for all those affected. We will provide updates as plans progress. And we will continue, of course, to update you on the status of our highways. But I also encourage uh, everyone to consult and visit Drive BC for the latest information. Uh, on highway conditions and on highways that are open. And I would now ask Minister Popham to provide her update. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us. We have uh, started to get reports on impacts that the flood has had on other crops and commodities. In the agriculture sector in the valley, we have about 57 blueberry producers that have been affected, about 2,100 acres of blueberries. We've got about 82 acres of raspberries that have also been impacted. Both of these types of commodities will need to be ripped out and replanted. Uh, many of them are still underwater. We have field crops, approximately 420 acres that were unharvested at the time of the flood, and now uh, they are lost. This is 4,000 tons of stored and unharvested field vegetables that are most likely damaged and lost. Most of these were on the Sumas Prairie or in Fort Langley. Uh, some farms are still able to salvage some of their crops and we uh, congratulate them for trying to get that food into the food supply right now. It's a tough job. But cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, carrots and leeks have been significantly imp uh, impacted. We've got two major flower growers that are under several feet of water. Um, this is about 250,000 plants that are lost in nurseries. About 100% of bulb growers in the Sumat, Sumas Flats have been impacted. We also have two land-based fish farms in the Fraser Valley that have been impacted. The losses haven't been entered yet, uh, but we believe that all fish are presumed lost. These are tilapia and barramundi fish. Um, we also have, unfortunately, a commercial Chinook hatchery on Vancouver Island that also has been damaged due to the flood. Avtar Dillon and his brother have a 25-acre farm in Abbotsford. You might have been hearing about them recently. They're the folks that have the saffron farm. They've been in the news because they've been growing about 250,000 saffron crocus bulbs. They've tried for the last five years to find a method to get it just right and they were in the news uh, a month ago because they um, were, sh were showing success and this was gonna be their first year. Unfortunately, that's all underwater now and we're, our hearts are with them. It's devastating. We are closely working with local governments, of course, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency around the task of disposing uh, and removing uh, animal carcasses lost in the flood. But I'm gonna take this moment um, to talk uh, about a very difficult issue for our producers. There's been a lot of interest by folks around uh, understanding the impacts to the livestock sector. There's been um, a lot of interest in the numbers and the totals, and I get that, uh, but I think right now it's important to understand that this curiosity that we have about reporting out daily on, on deceased animals is impacting our livestock producers negatively. Each time we update those numbers, it turns out to be another traumatic moment for our livestock producers. And to tell you the truth, um, they don't really wanna go there right now. They're still in the emergency and dealing with these events. And what the producers are telling me is that they wanna focus on the positive moments that are keeping them going. So I won't be updating the animal mortality totals uh, over the next few days out of respect for the livestock producers. Um, they're hurting very deeply and I appeal to uh, your compassionate side as you address this issue as well. 
Gary Bars is a dairy farmer in the valley, and he started moving uh, dairy cattle out on Tuesday and continued to do that. He was able to uh, move approximately 2,000 cows with his truck and his trailer. And today he continues to relocate animals back to their home barns uh, as the water has been receding. I talked to him this morning and he has conveyed uh, the message to me that yes, he has seen some very heartbreaking situations, um, but he is amazed by the generosity of British Columbians and the donations that are coming in and the positive messages. And so that's what is keeping him going. And so I think that's what we need to keep doing. We're seeing increased access for farmers to get back to their farm so they can assess the damage and uh, increase access for feed and water to animals in need is also on the rise. We saw another airdrop to a hog farm uh, of grain yesterday, so that's good news. We've seen permits for re-entry that were issued yesterday. This included livestock feed deliveries, hay deliveries, mushroom hauling, chicken hauling, uh, egg pickup, vet access and equipment servicing. These access arrangements are definitely helping secure our supply chain right now. Uh, our ministry staff are supporting ongoing livestock relocations and right now we're working on um, a process to support feed and housing costs for relocating these herds. About 20 herds were relocated from the Sumas Prairie and many relocations are happening around other flood affected areas in the province. We're working with the BC Dairy Association and the BC Cattlemen's to ensure that herds are being looked after and in fact we are having a meeting tonight at seven o'clock with the BC Cattlemen's to just talk about the issues at hand. Um, the relocation process is a difficult process. It's very physical work and also it's we're dealing with animals that are under a, a lot of stress and so the work there is um, is difficult and I just uh, thank the people that are committed to doing that right now. We're working collaboratively to address the issue of feed in the areas uh, of the Nicola Valley. Ranchers and small lot farms, particularly in Merritt, have uh, sustained huge feed losses. The BC Horse Council and the Nicola Valley Rodeo Association are two of the groups that are helping to support the efforts there and they're doing a great job. Um, there's ongoing planning to identify hay storage options uh, and the BC Forage Council is helping us manage this. So thanks to, to them as well. Um, to wrap up today, I'm just gonna leave you with a, a short story about a chicken farmer by the name of Dave Martins and his family. Dave Martins was located right in the middle of the flood areas and his family, they've lost everything. They've lost their home, they've lost their barns. And over this past week, uh, along with a long list of other farmers, I've sent Dave a message and he's responded back. Sometimes it's just a good night, sometimes it's just a good morning. But he's been sending me photos of a fire hydrant where he's been relocated to outside of that home is a fire hydrant that shows the levels of the water receding. Yesterday he sent me a photo of that fire hydrant and all the water had uh, receded around. But he sent me a, a picture this morning and it's a pile of stuff that he and his wife grabbed as they rushed out of their, their place. And in that pile of stuff was a wall hanging and it's the word hope. He texted me that he walked by that pile of stuff this morning and he said to himself, no kidding Dave, that's my glimmer of hope. So if Dave and his family can feel hope at this time, it's a reminder to all of us that we will get there if we stick together and we will rebuild. Thank you. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. We'll start here in the room. First question to Mira Bain, CBC. Minister Farnworth, how concerned are you about water contamination in the flood zone, uh, especially for those residents with private wells? What's the province doing to monitor drinking water quality and how long will this monitoring go on for? 
So there are a number of, of approaches that are taken when dealing with uh, drinking water in the, uh, the flood impacted areas. First off, many municipalities shut down their water system to protect the overall water system. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are aware, and then manure systems were also uh, closed down as well to, to, to limit the amount of contamination. Uh, that being said, uh, we do get uh, water tested. Uh, public health is involved uh, in that regard to ensure that when an evacuation order is lifted, um, that people are able to return safely, and that includes water. Uh, it may well be that in, in, in a number of instances, and we have seen those where a, bo a boil water advisory is in place, uh, until either you know uh, 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 wells are, are, are cleared um, uh, for 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 full use, uh, but there is significant attention paid to uh, to water quality and the ability to make sure that when people go back, it is safe for them. Mira, do you have a follow up? The Thompson Nicola Regional Director for Spences Bridge Area has appealed for help uh, for communities along Highway Eight. Uh, can you please update the situation there and what's being done to help? Uh, there is a significant uh, help and assistance in the area of Highway, highway 8 as we know that that particular highway was, was impacted in, beyond belief. Um, so there have been uh, airdrops of food going in. Uh, there have been uh, 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 initiatives to, to use forest roads to provide access. Um, there is uh, um, uh, military uh, uh, flights uh, that have also assisted in dropping off, but also in, in, in using LIDAR, for example, to be able to assess the state of the road and a potential uh, um, reworking of that road. Uh, but uh, in terms of ensuring that people have emergency supports, uh, the EMBC is working uh, to make sure that those are, those, those are in place. And as far as we are aware, uh, at this point in time, everyone who needs to be able to access supports is, is able to. Uh, but I will say this, if there is someone who feels they're not absolutely to, uh, to get in, in contact um, with, uh, with, with Emergency Management BC and those lines are there. And at the same time, TELUS is working very hard to ensure that uh, connectivity is restored along that route. For the next question, we go to the phones. Prabjot Kalon, Omni TV. Yeah, thank you so much for taking this question. And I spoke to a number of smash prairie, blueberry, and vegetable growers, farmers. They want government to ask banks to hold any equipment or mortgage payment at least six months with no interest, as they are now jobless and homeless. So is the government thinking about that? Um, what I can tell you is, is that given the scope of this disaster and the different kinds of supports that are going to be needed, uh, we are working very closely to determine exactly what those needs are. There are obviously insurance programs that are in place, both in terms of disaster financial assistance, which can look after a lot of infrastructure. Uh, we know that there are, there are farm uh, programs in place, but we also know there may be additional gaps that uh, we need to, to deal with, and that's where we're working very closely with the, uh, the federal government uh, to, uh, to make sure that, that we are in a position uh, to deal with those kinds of situations. Prabhjot, do you have a follow-up? Yes, but they, they can't pay their any payment at this moment because they are not their homes, they are living somewhere else, they don't have the documents, IDs, they want governments to hold their payments. And the second question is, uh, I know it's too early, they can go their homes and what's going to happen next, but they are in flood zone. So what's going to happen next to them? Why, first of all, municipalities is allowing them to stay or develop their properties if, it is a, if there's no insurance, no coverage at all? And do you think the government will be giving the full recovery after this? Because they want to know now they are in dark, they are in stress right away. I spoke hundreds of the farmers yesterday. Um, as, I, as I've said, uh, we are working very hard to determine exactly what the needs are, particularly in the agricultural areas. Uh, the issue around the floodplain and the orders, um, as we're seeing, we're seeing improvements uh, and, and, and routes are being opened. So Highway 1 and a lot of the, uh, the regional roads in that community, the water has receded. Uh, they are looking at the impacts to make sure that they're safe. And as that happens, then those states of, of, of either evacuation order or alert are lifted. At the same time, we know there is significant uh, financial uh, impact uh, to farmers. And as I said, there are you know, uh, agricultural programs in place. 
but we also know there are gaps and that's why particularly given the nature of this event and the nature of the damage we'll be working very closely with the federal government to, in, to ensure that we are able to get the, the, the assistance that people impacted particularly uh, in, in these areas that you're talking about uh, uh, available. Next question we go to Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, for Minister Fleming, um, I know you mentioned that the hope is once Highway 1 reopens, it won't have to close again. But with the storms coming up, what metrics will the province be looking at in terms of the potential of closing that span again? And on the Coquihalla, with the timeline now for um, commercial vehicles by the end of January, what does that mean for other vehicles through that span? And and is there any sense of the cost of the repairs between now and the end of January just to get it to that point? Sure. Let me thank you, Richard. Let me start with the Coquihalla first. Um, the plan is to continue to uh, see what is possible and prioritize commercial traffic uh, through the number five. So um, alongside of that is maintaining the uh, functionality of Highway 3, which um, uh, as you know, reopened last Friday. Um, and. Uh, we have crews out there continuously improving it. So having um, those two highways connecting to the interior will be incredibly valuable along with, uh, valuable along with, the, with Highway 90, 99. No idea on cost at this point in time, but we have engineers uh, assessing uh, the extent of the damage. Um, we're throwing all the resources we need to to get the Coquihalla ready for the plan that we adopt to repair it uh, to some functionality. So I outlined uh, some of the de debris clearance, some of the pre-works, um, some of the uh, blasting that's being done. We're armoring the uh, sections of the Coquihalla that uh, are intact as well to get ready for uh, anticipated uh, storm events. Um, so we'll, we'll have more uh, to say on the Coquihalla uh, in the coming days, but I did want to provide an update today from the ministry that they are planning to uh, see whether we can have that uh, open until uh, open by the end of January. Um, as it relates to Highway 1, and uh, just over an hour from now, we're reopening at 2 p.m. Um, that is very good news. It does come with a caution. Um, we we're we we're actually quite pleased that the condition of the road, having been under water for many many days, uh, is in good condition. Uh, the the electric systems for highway lighting um, are intact. Uh, we had worried that you know we were potentially going to reopen a dark highway. That's not the case. The variable speed technology that uh, advises motorists is also uh, functional, uh, but people are going to have to go much more slowly. Um, there is swamp-like water in the uh, grass medians between uh, the separated part of the highway, uh, and we will be coning that so that motorists pay particular attention and uh, stay well clear of the, the shoulders. Uh, in that area, uh, that will necessitate slower speeds. We'll have crews out constantly during these projected weather events uh, to assess uh, how the highway is performing, whether uh, water having receded is is returning, uh, and we'll make the call based on what we operationally see happening. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Uh, this is from Minister Farnworth. I've heard some, from some people in Merritt who have been getting up each morning at 8 o'clock and calling in to the Red Cross to have access to the $2,000. Uh, they say the lines are swamped and, and a lot of people can't get through each day. So they were just wondering if there's a cutoff date, when to apply for that money. That's the, the provincial and Red Cross money. And is there any way to figure out an online registration uh, to avoid some of these headaches that they're experiencing on the phone lines? Um, I would say, yeah, we are absolutely aware of the situation, and we have been in uh, in contact with the uh, the Red Cross about this. I know that they are working on that. Uh, that being said, uh, I do urge patient, people to be patient and know there is no cutoff date. Uh, so uh, don't people should not feel that they need to get on right now, and if they don't apply, they're not going to get the uh, the two thousand dollars. There is not a cutoff date, uh, and I can tell you that Red Cross uh, is uh, is working on that situation. Next question, Penny Daflo, CTV. Oh, thanks very much. I just wanted to start out with a question for a colleague uh, for, for Minister Fleming. Uh, when it comes to Highway 1 reopening and non-essential goods, what's your messages to business and consumers who've been expecting goods or equipment, and do you expect that it could cause a kind of wider scale impacts in terms of the Christmas retail rush? So all of the efforts to reopen uh, transportation corridors is designed to uh, get at the bottleneck of um, goods that were stalled while highways were closed and railways were closed. So 
CP reopening uh, is, you know, helping to move two thirds of containers that have been in our port, getting those to the rest of British. Uh, getting those goods to the rest of British Columbia and the rest of Canada. Um, uh, CN's uh, update that uh, they expect to be back in operation uh, shortly is also good news to have that second uh, national railway uh, connection. Obviously, uh, Port of Prince Rupert, uh, which ships significant uh, goods and is close to being Canada's second busiest port, uh, has never lost functionality. So those supply chains have remained open, as has the northern highway systems. Uh, in, in, in the province. Um, Highway 1, just going back to that, will be available for general travel. Um, Highway 7 will remain uh, under orders to prioritize the transportation of commercial goods because it remains that important critical connection to Highway 3 and getting to the interior. We're also hearing good news as well about the volume of goods getting through the United States in transit back into other parts of British Columbia. The federal government uh, deserves a lot of credit working with our American counterparts to uh, create a set of flexibilities to help us uh, in this time of need uh, and allow uh, much more uh, commercial traffic to go to transit through uh, Washington State and, and get back into the Okanagan and interior. Penny, do you have a follow-up? I do, and this one is from Minister Farnworth. Um, you know, in recent days, you've been talking a lot about listening to and trusting the experts on the ground, and yet I'm looking at a letter right now from the Metro Vancouver Mayor's Committee um, that they sent you emphasizing that they have the right to make decisions around localized emergencies, including deployment of the alert ready system. So given that some communities may need to use that system in the coming days, depending on the conditions, will you commit to letting local governments decide on whether to implement alert ready? Absolutely, that's been our position right from the right all along. Uh, it's why the decision was made uh, in the case of Abbotsford uh, uh, this, the, just over a week ago, which was they contacted us. Say they said we wanted to use an alert ready uh, alert for the area. We worked with them. We prepared. Uh, the, the, we had the message. We were working on the area that they wanted it to go, uh, and then they contacted us and said, "No, uh, we don't think this is the right thing to do at this moment." Um, and that uh, I said, "Absolutely, uh, that is." Uh, 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 respecting the uh, local decision making by the experts on the ground who know the situation as it's happening minute by minute, hour by hour. Uh, and that has been our approach right from the get go. For the next question, we go to Derek Penner, Vancouver Sun. Hi. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Minister Fleming. Um, as this is all happening, Whistler Black Home did have its opening day today. I was just wondering if you are hearing uh, reports of whether or not traffic for that event um, had any impact on access through the Highway 99 corridor. Uh, Highway 99 is functioning well to from the communities uh, from the Lower Mainland through to Lions Bay, Squamish, Whistler. Uh, the travel restriction order is on the area um, uh, between Pemberton and Lillooet uh, where the slide activity happened and for that area uh, it's only for passenger vehicles and nothing larger than a cube van at this point in time. So that connection uh, is vitally important and remains under travel order. So um, there, there may be checkpoints and advisories uh, at, at that stretch of the highway, but it would it, be you know, many, many kilometers past uh, Whistler. And it's, it's really to protect the traveling public and remind them of what uh, travel orders are in place. And as with all the travel orders that remain in place, we will be updating on a daily basis uh, the status of uh, those uh, necessary restrictions. Derek, do you have a follow-up? Um, I, I do have a follow-up. Uh, how, for Minister Fleming or maybe Minister Farnworth, um, what, what is the status update on uh, fuel supplies in the region? Um, so we're hearing from the Canadian Fuel Association that after a very uh, brisk weekend of sales that things are uh, substantially normal in, in, in the areas of the province where fuel restrictions are in place. Recall that as the uh, Lower Mainland, uh, Fraser Valley, um, everything west of Hope, uh, Sunshine Coast, uh, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. Um, so there is fuel supply, uh, and there's also been significant developments that are helping uh, maintain fuel supply. So barging of, of uh, uh, refined fuel from the United States, and uh, now that we have rail connection, we expect uh, activity there. 
and there will be an update from Trans Mountain on um, when it will reopen and uh, resupply the Parkland refinery with uh, with crude. Next question, we go to Colton Davies, Radio NL. Uh, you gave uh, Minister Fleming. You gave the uh, uh, timeline for commercial vehicles when they could use the Coquihalla next in late January. So obviously, the Coquihalla won't be open over the holiday season. Um, does, should the public be of the mindset then that non-essential travel restrictions will still be in place and, and road checks between the southern interior and the south coast over Christmas? Yeah, so the restrictions that are in place on Highway 3 right now are really around uh, helping get uh, goods into communities in BC where there have been shortages, uh, making sure that uh, commercial traffic is reconnected uh, to the supply chain and able to make uh, deliveries. Um, obviously a lot of goods are, are late for their original timeline after the massive storm event so the priority is really getting uh, goods moving again. That restriction will remain in place uh, for the time being but we, we will update uh, the public as that situation improves on what uh, restrictions may be lifted. So those timelines will be uh, updated as we move forward. Colton, do you have a uh, follow-up? Yes, uh, thank you for that. So uh, in any case, obviously, um, you know, uh, non-essential travel is, is cut off on the highways between the southern interior and the south coast, and we've seen flights added in Kamloops and Kelowna and, and larger planes being used. And we have heard reports about uh, price gouging by some of the airlines, and I'm not sure if this would be completely federal jurisdiction, but um, with the provincial state of emergency in place, uh, could the province uh, do anything if it did determine that um, there was um, uh, prices going up uh, substantially by airlines here? No, thanks for that uh, for that question. And that's certainly we will can be following up on. I know initially after we saw the, the uh, after the disaster took place, what we noticed was that the airlines were actually the the the, the, the prices were uh, stable. Uh, and not increasing. So if there is an indication that that is taking place, obviously we would be looking at what we can do as a province, but also given that airlines are federally regulated, uh, working with the, uh, the federal government to make sure that that is something that's not taking place. Next question, Lisa Yuzda, City News. Hi there. I just wondered, when you're talking about this, like, build back better, I wonder if you can talk about what you're talking about. Is that just more... Uh, emphasis on mitigating when storms like this happen or will it be things like on a grander scale of making sure that people can travel by rail more instead of having to get in their cars and do things to mitigate climate change on a grander scale so build back better means a number of things what it and I can give you some examples um, in so for example it means making sure that your infrastructure is able to deal with greater uh, cyclical um, uh, events. So, for example, instead of a 1 in 50 year flood, looking at a 1 in 100, recognizing that the frequency of those events is likely to be uh, more often than it was in the past. Uh, it means making sure that uh, culverts, um, uh, drainage ditches are able to handle, um, you know, larger volumes of water. It means ensuring that dikes are built to uh, a higher standard, for example. Uh, those are some other examples can be what you saw in High River in Alberta after their catastrophic uh, weather event where it was determined that, you know what, we really need to move part of the community to another location. Um, likewise, in the Grand Forks flood, it was determined that, you know what, that low-lying flooded area really should not be a residential area uh, anymore. And so those residences were moved to a different location. It can mean a number of things. Um, it is also uh, ensuring that, you know, we have strong transit and transportation plans, all of those things. But it's, uh, it, it is the way of the future, and it is very much uh, a part of the work that's, that's under, underway uh, with regards to the overhaul of the Emergency Program Act. Um, as I said, there's four key pillars around it. Um, prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? I do. I, I'm just wondering what communities that might be. Is this a CMAS Prairie that might have to look at, you know, communities that people just won't go back into their homes? And just a quick one, can we get a date ballpark on when passenger vehicles will be able to go on the Coke again? Is that not until spring? So, so building back better means assessing situations in every different location. Uh, one of the things that that's obviously is important and, uh, you know, 
is ensuring you've got good flood mapping. I mean, there's been a lot of it being done, a lot of it being funded, uh, but, may, but you don't, as a rule, build on floodplains, and a lot of that is already taken into account. But there are areas such as Sumas Prairie, which are significant agricultural uh, uh, producing uh, uh, areas uh, and dairy herds, and what we want to do is to make sure that that what the the the, the infrastructure that is there uh, is able to withstand um, you know um, um, events such as what we have seen. Um, and in terms of the Coquihalla, I'll turn that to Minister Fleming. So uh, it's it's just too soon to to tell. The plan at this point in time, though, is to try and. Uh restore this vitally important uh, corridor for goods movement and prioritize uh, commercial uh, uh, m uh, vehicles uh, to move uh, uh, goods and services to between the province and the rest of the country. Uh, we will uh, look to restore and update what kind of passenger service we can provide um, as we know more about the situation. But uh, right now, it, it, it's going to depend on what kind of pinch points there are on a, on a partially restored Coquihalla, uh, what kind of queuing there might be, uh, what kind of volumes of traffic it can handle. The decisions will flow from the data based on the uh, repairs that we're able to make that uh, may bring back access. And uh, again, the timeline is around late January, but the plan at this point in time is to uh, see if we can restore that as a route for commercial traffic. We have time for one more question. We go to Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, wanted to ask, about the integrated Indigenous response and recovery deployment teams announced yesterday. I know Minister Rankin isn't here, but um, wanted you to say uh, just where they've been deployed so far, how many communities, and what exactly they're doing on the ground. Uh, thank you uh, for that, uh, that question. Uh, what I can tell you, those, those uh, teams um, are, are being assembled and being deployed, obviously, to the most impacted areas. Uh, I can't give a specific location uh, right now, but um, obviously the, uh, the canyon and, uh, and the Highway 8, uh, Highway 8 uh, region uh, would be uh, uh, the, the main areas of focus. Mike, do you have a follow-up? Sure. Um, you know, this latest storm has just touched down. Uh, want to know which dikes your government is most concerned about with this new rain? Um, the, uh, the the focus right now is on the, the the flood impacted areas where the ground is saturated and the dikes have been under have been under under pressure. In particular, that Sumas dike where there was a, an overtopping and, and a breach, and which has been repaired, uh, and so that the entire region uh, is getting the uh, the attention and the focus. Uh, to, to make sure uh, that uh, not only are the crews there, but the equipment, the sandbags, of which I think about two million, um, are, are in place to be able to deal with the weather events that we're seeing. Just on that, uh, the current weather events, the ones that we're experiencing right now, um, is what we would call a typical uh, November storm. Um, but obviously, as I said, the ground is saturated, so we are watching that go through. The one after it, is and we're hoping that there's a bit of a break because that allows some of the water to go away. Um, then again, the, the one following that is viewed as a typical um, uh, November storm. Uh, it is the one after that for next Tuesday, which is coming out of the Philippines. It is that far out in the Pacific, but it is also uh, the most significant uh, of the three events, that, the three pulses of three events that we're facing right now that we are uh, particularly uh, concerned about. Uh, and that's where over the next uh, few days, um, we will have more and more accurate information on the intensity of uh, the tracking of that storm as, uh, as uh, um, uh, uh, Environment Canada uh, gets uh, better and, and more informed uh, data. And just again, back to the local area, we're also very much in, in contact with Washington State in terms of what's happening south of the border. Thank you, everyone. That concludes today's update.